All right, we are live. We're just gonna wait just a few seconds to let everyone join this room. And then we'll go ahead and get started by doing a, a sound check, but we'll wait just a second. And while I have you, um, Dr. Postman, Dr. Howell, Dr. Maida, and I would love to know where you're coming in from. So you have a chat on your phone or your, um, or your PC or Mac. So feel free to use that chat. Let us know where you're from. Are you in the States? What state? What country? Are you not sure anymore? That's okay. We don't know what day it is. So um, feel free to let us know where you're joining us from. We always like to see that. And we are almost at 50. That will get started. Folks, my name is Ryan Chancoco with C-Surgeries. Um, thank you for joining us for another webinar. Uh, this one is going to be a very interesting and educational one, just like all the others. And we're honored to have our panelists here. Um, I'm gonna have each panelist do a quick sound check by introducing themselves, um, their name, their organization. And I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Postma, if you could introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Dr. Postma. I'm the Vice Chairman and Professor of Otolaryngology at Medical College of Georgia in Augusta, Georgia, and I'm the Director of the Center for Voice, Airway, and Swallowing Disorders. Fantastic. I can hear you loud and clear and see you clearly. Dr. Howell, if you could do the same, please. Dr. Rebecca Howell, I'm at the University of Cincinnati. I'm in the Department of Otolaryngology. I'm an Associate Professor, and I'm the Division Chief of Laryngology. I'm the Director of the Voice, Swallowing, and Airway Center, the Rocco del Vera and... Uh, Robin Cotton Professional Voice and Swallowing Center. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Howell. I can clear you. And Dr. Mehta, if we can have you do the same, please. Hi, Deepak Mehta, Professor in Pediatric Laryngology at Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children's Hospital. Fantastic. Dr. Mehta, there's still a little bit of lag. So throughout, we may ask you to uh, turn off the video. That, that might help. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, again, folks, thank you. Hello, Las Vegas, London, New York, and Stratford University. Um, glad to have you all here. Utilize the chat function, the Q&A function. Uh, this is going to be very interactive. Dr. Postman Howell have agreed to answer questions throughout as well as at the end. So again, feel free to leverage all the technology available to you on Zoom. And if you have any questions about uh, anything on the platform, feel free to send me a chat. I am um, Ryan Chancoco, so don't hesitate to do that. And with that, Dr. Howell, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Dr. Mehta, uh, to see surgeries and also to Cook Medical for sponsoring this talk. Today, we're gonna to be talking about esophageal dilation, the operating room to the office. So I will be known as Meg, uh, AKA Rebecca, and my colleague, Hercules, AKA Greg. <laughs> Here are our disclosures. So let's just get started. So definitions, definitions, uh, dilation, expansible force against a luminal stenosis. This is, is that intuitive to all of us. We all know what these things are. If you're listening to this talk, you know what an esophageal dilation is. You also probably are most familiar with bougies. Um, bougie is a fixed diameter push type dilator. Um, what you, maybe you have thought about or not thought about is you have two different types of forces. So you both get a radial force um, and a shearing force. They're reusable. They're also known as Maloney's, Hurst, Savory types. We also have the balloons, the radial expansion types. This is a radial force alone. They're disposable, oftentimes wire guided or fixed wire, um, such as the Cook Medical product. One of the biggest differences that you'll notice between this, the Hercules, the Hercules 100 balloon and a, and a standard GI balloon is the length. It is uh, well, shorter, which is far easier to deal with in the office. You'll also notice, and we'll go through this in a couple of videos later, but there are also a, a very um, user-friendly tag, which helps you out as well. So Greg, size does matter. Dilator diameters in millimeters or French. So the ratio is always a one to three, roughly speaking. 15 millimeters is 45 French. For my mathematicians out there, yes, it's not exactly precise, but this is, this is, an, this is good enough for Greg Postma. All right. The rule of three, moderate resistance, no more than three dilators. Um, what, we, what we as surgeons usually uh, have been trained as is, you know, basically you get a little bit of bleeding, you should probably stop. Modifications to these techniques include injections of steroids, 
needle knife electric cautery, uh, the super physiologic stretch, uh, which is the 120 French. Greg, can you walk us through the super stretch? Who gets a super stretch? Yeah, super stretch is, was popularized by veterinarians in canines for many years. Uh, then Peter Belofsky and um, um, uh, Joe Spiegel started to do this. And so it's taking a stretch way beyond 60 French. In the video you see here, it's in the operating room. These people need reasonable sedation to use two flexible balloons, or I've always preferred under general anesthesia, I can put a 60 French balloon in a patient. If there's no bleeding of any significance, I'll put a bougie alongside it and then inflate the balloon. So for example, a 30 French bougie and a 60 French balloon would be a 90 French super dilation or a 50 or 60 French bougie with a 60 French balloon would be a 110 or 120 French dilation. And we use these in people with softgel webs, empiric dilations in folks. And over a period of time, we try to even do this in our radiation and chemotherapy patients, but we have to be far more careful in those folks. So bougie versus balloon. Justina did a meta-analysis back in 2018 where, we lo where they looked at endoscopic dilation with bougies versus balloon. Um, they looked at 461 patients. At the end of this, what they found is there was no real difference in symptomatic relief, no difference in recurrence rates at 12 months, perforations, or, um, and, and excuse me, the only thing that they found was that the balloon actually has less post-procedure pain. So in-office dys dysphagia, you know, this really has been, you know, thanks to Hercules, I mean, Greg, uh, in 2005, the TNE was revisited uh, and over 700 different cases were shown for, uh, again, this, this type of technique, the transnasal esophagoscopy. Indications at that time included reflux, globus, dysphagia, biopsy, um, head and neck cancers. The limitations are the nasal vault. If you can't get through the, the nasal vault, um, it becomes exceedingly painful uh, for both you and the patient. Next, in 2016, Van Katessen and Belofsky also showed you know, some office-based treatment of dysphagia where they talked about a little bit of this, including the super stretch. So in-office dysphagia has, has been continued. So then in 2009, uh, Dr. Reese demonstrated the first series of transnasal balloon dilation um, through the nose. So the transnasal, using a transnasal esophagus scope. In 2018, we looked at our series. This was 47 patients. The difference here is we actually looked at 100% of ours were radiated. Um, we showed at that time that this is a safe technique and uh, also showed that there was cost savings. So at that, we, we showed it was about $15,000 per case. So why in the office? Well, it's faster for patients. Patients can come in the same day. There's no NPO after midnight. Um, I let them, in fact, I let them eat right away. I encourage them to eat right away. Physician's time is better utilized. The operating room takes a lot of time, especially with all of the restrictions that we're all undergoing right now. This is really nice. We've been able to keep people going, keep people eating and even in the office, despite you know our COVID world and shutdowns of the ORs. Rapid diagnosis and you get immediate treatment. So you get a diagnosis, you get to see it, you get to visualize it and you get to treat it right away. Patients honestly are preferring it. So safety. General mask, general uh, general anesthesia and MAC get, gets avoided, obviously. No rigid instrumentation. And we already talked a little bit about the cost savings. So why not in the office? Um, questionable and an, uh, unfavorable anatomy or questionable airway. On the other hand, I would actually argue that in some patients, I think I actually prefer to do the in-office on the, some of these difficult head and neck patients. Sometimes we'll take them to the OR, but still keep them awake. Um, you can do an awake, you can do an awake, awake sedated as well, which is really nice. Um, patients are still able to go home the same day and do really well. The intolerant patient, um, patients that, that uh, and we'll show you an example a little bit later, but the ones that start to, you know, do the, the back away, you know, as you're coming next to them with the scope, you know, you haven't approached their nose, they're not going to do well. Um, and then, of course, there's insurance issues. So within this presentation, I have a couple different um, videos and then some clips. These can all be found uh, at Cook Medical uh, backslash laryngology at their landing page. So you can use these, um, you know, feel free to obviously rewatch Greg and I's wonderful, entertaining presentation today, and then go back and actually watch some of these videos as well. 
What you see here is the transnasal esophagus scope in the cartoon, which is looking at this narrow stricture. And then using Seldinger technique, the wire guide, it, the wire is placed through the channel scope. The channel, the, then, the balloon then goes again, Seldinger over the wire to dilate this narrow segment. All the while the transnasal esophagoscopy or the, the scope is actually watching and looking at watching the stenosis. You also have a lovely reference product label that we talked about before, which shows you um, different stages of pressure, both in, it shows you ATM, it shows you French, it shows you millimeter. So whichever way your brain is thinking, you have access to that information as does everyone else that's in the room with you. So patient complaints. Dysphagia is a symptom. It's not a diagnosis. Um, in 2016, we it, this was a multi-institution study um, that we published into it, that showed that males, obese, and then head and neck with dysphagia were the patients that predicted a change in management. So those are really, and this is a, uh, this is really why I sort of I do a lot more of my transnasal esophagoscopy and the transnasal esophagoscopy with dilations in the head and neck population. And we'll get into this a little bit more later. Esophageal strictures can be due to long-standing GERD, webs, rings, anastomotic, inflammatory, caustic. We've seen it and done them all. So Greg, can you take us through a little bit of the diagnostic testing? Sure, the average patient, you know, a lot of these patients are sent to us. We don't see them de novo. And so if we get emails, calls, or whatever, we want people to, we like people to undergo a contrast study. Some folks will come to us with a, with a barium swallow, which is a good screen for people with solid food dysphagia. The, the gold standard remains the modified barium swallow with an esophageal follow through. Uh, that's an important thing to make certain your institution. You're not just doing a modified barium swallow, but you need to look distally as well. We got to remember about 30 to 40% of patients with uh, demonstrable pathology in the distal esophagus or gastric cardia have referred complaints to above the clavicles. And so we're not doing our patients a service if we don't look down there as well. High uh, resolution manometry, particularly pharyngeal high resolution manometry is getting more commonly used through both speech therapists and um, surgeons at various centers, particularly um, Medical University of South Carolina with Dr. O'Rourke and the group at Wisconsin. And so we get some people that have solid dysphagia, but we're not having a diagnostic home run or a real diagnosis from our contrast study. And so sometimes we'll, we'll end up with HRMs in these people. And this is the next study here. We'll show you a little example of that. You know, here's some with a, a large cricopharyngeal so-called bar, radiologic finding. And I could tell you this person has solid food dysphagia and you'd believe me, I could tell you it's a 70 year old who had this since about 40 or 50% of 70 year olds will have an obstructing CP bar, but no symptoms. And so manometry helps us. This is a great article and it's from Dysphagia Journal uh, from Leaper some years ago, just demonstrating some differences. And the, on the left side, you see a cricopharyngeus muscle of normal size, but this can be too tight it can have a failure of relaxation. And in contrast to that, the one on the opposite side shows a massively hypertrophic cricopharyngeus muscle. And that one you know, may respond temporarily to being stretched, but more likely needs to be cut while a tight muscle or one that doesn't relax completely on the left often will respond really well to a good dilation in the office or in the operating room. Mention HRM. If one looks at the top, this is a magnified view of the pharyngoesophageal segment at the top. But when the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes, that should be low pressure. It should be a wintry color, a blue color. When you have elevated pressure, this is called an elevated intrabolus pressure, which is indicative of the tongue hypopharynx having to squeeze tighter to overcome a obstruction to flow. In this case, it being a very tight cricopharyngeus muscle. After dilation, this patient was kind enough to let us retest him and we've restored the normal physiology here in that when the pharyngoesophageal segment fully relaxes, you have a nice low pressure so one doesn't have to work so hard to push a bolus past this area. 
So, you know, who gets stretched? People talk about that, uh, especially when the people would visit us prior to COVID or now, um, emails and so on. It's really variable. Different path, um, practices have different referral patterns, the type of patients that come to you. Different practices have different relationships with their GI colleagues, some very collegial, some less so. And so in general, for us, we tend to have people that have some type of an abnormal imaging study. Even when I'll do a T and E on a patient, or Rebecca does, we look down there and it may be a little tight at the CP muscle. If we see an obvious stricture on the hypopharynx or past it, we don't get a contrast study. But a lot of times, particularly really high up in the esophagus, we don't get the perfect view we might like. And so we do rely mostly on contrast studies. We get a lot of folks sent from our GI colleagues. Most of the GI folks don't like the so-called high strictures. They don't like working in the hypopharynx and the proximal esophagus. Their patients are awake and patients tend to react more to instrumentation and dilation in the proximal esophagus and hypopharynx compared to the distal esophagus. Empiric dilations, um, my love of that has waxed and waned over the years since I've I'm doing more and more of them nowadays. I went through the, the GI literature on empiric dilations and the response rates were pretty extraordinary. They vary between zero and 60%. That's fairly extraordinary range. And so we're actually putting together a large multi-institutional group to look at this. But we know that in general, it seems about 20 to 30% of patients improve even though we never proved there was a problem there. We're not sure why. Part of the theory, part of the thought now, and a lot of this has been pushed by uh, uh, Peter Blavsky out uh, in Davis in Sacramento, California, is there are very small webs or areas of fibrosis within the cricopharyngeus muscle that we're not seeing or demonstrated on our diagnostic tests, but particularly with super dilations, we're rupturing this area or tearing it and getting responses. So perhaps empiric uh, procedures might be a really, really good place to do in-office procedures. Low cost, really low risk, with a 20 to 30 percent chance you're going to help some of these patients. We stretch those folks that were kind of the last hope. I hate we hate to take hope away from patients. It's probably the key thing. Work with these people no matter what, because taking away hope is just brutal for our patients. So we'll do repeated dilations in people that have undergone repetitive surgery and chemo radiation. And there are fibrotic mess, they can't elevate their larynx, but you'd be surprised. In some folks that you don't think you're gonna make any headway at all, you'll get significant improvement, which is a dramatic change or a dramatic improvement in their quality of life. And so I think it's worth you know two or three dilations in a lot of these people and the alaryngeal um, um, population, as Rebecca will talk later, that's the people you want to start with. People that don't have a larynx in the office makes life really easy when you're learning a new technique like this. This is a great example of a web. If you go back there, Rebecca, um, on the contrast study, we only saw this single web on a single image laterally. But if you look on the right, intraoperatively, this patient had three different independent webs. And because you're getting cuts with your modified barium swallows and your barium swallows, webs are often missed. We had one week in which our radiologists missed two. We had three webs that week. Radiologists only saw one of them. We saw two of them. So we'd really encourage you, just like you wouldn't do sinus surgery without looking at your own CT scan, look at your own contrast studies. Go through them frame by frame, if at all possible. You'll be surprised how many small webs you're going to pick up. And they look small radiographically. But as you know, in this example, sometimes they're markedly larger than you might expect. So Dr. Fortzman, when, when, I, when you're looking at the swallow study, is there anything in particular you'll see which the radiologist would have missed or any particular things which makes you feel that there might be something going on there? I think that that example we gave there on the lateral, it's usually not in an AP view. It's almost always in the lateral or the RAO view in which we quite literally, we, we slow it down and then we can just use the wheel on the mouse to go through frame by frame. And it's amazing how often there'll be a single little area of indentation or web only on one frame. So you can see how someone's in a hurry doing a barium swallow could easily miss that 
on 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 their review. And these people, even these tiny webs, can sometimes have significant degrees of both solid food dysphagia and a lot of them with pill dysphagia as well. That little ridge there will catch food or pills as they're going by, but it's not usually every swallow. Some swallows wander by, some don't. Uh, but I've really been surprised how many webs we've found over the, the last few years. So in officer OR, that's, that's, you know, becomes a big question as Rebecca has already mentioned, tolerance is key. If the patient's a whiner and running away from you, they're not going to let you put a, with a, with a 4.1 or 4.2 flexible laryngoscope, they're not going to let you, you know, get them with the big scope. So general anxiety, psychiatric issues, this area, the, these kind of concerns. She's not enjoying it. Look at that, look at that expression there. That's one of Dr. Howell's speech language pathologists. Loving, loving the lidocaine. Um, the pathology itself, you know, a, 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 a severe stricture may not be the right person to start with, for example. But if you're going to be doing particularly repetitive dilations in people, doing this in the office is, is safer and it's a great way to take care of these people. Airway risk with or without sedation, sometimes safer in, in the clinic or in the OR, that depends on its dealer's choice there. Anticoagulation, we usually don't Fred, care do much about. Do you take about. your parent, do you, sorry to interrupt you again, but you know, do you take your patients off of anticoagulation? This is always something that comes up. Sure, I, I don't, um, unless when someone's had prior, you know, prior minor issues in the office of the OR. And so, for example, I had a recent chemo radiation therapy patient that we had dilated up to like 50 or 60 and then brought them back and then did a super dilation, got a bit of a, bit of a laceration and they were on Xarelto and, you know, that bled a bit. I mean, you know, that was a surprise. So it took a while to, to take care of that. So that patient, if I bring that patient back, I'll probably take my Xarelto, but that's the only one right now in general. Um, we don't worry much about it. The other issue, of course, is the number of hands you have available. In the operating room, you know, there's always someone around to help you out. There's always a resident, fellows, nurses, extra nurses, med students. There's always extra hands. In the office, we, we, you know, a lot of offices run a little bit on the lean side as far as personnel trying to save money, but you need three sets of hands, as we'll demonstrate later. So that can often determine if you do it in the operating room or the office. So when you're back in, so back in the operating room, much to what Greg is saying too, it's a nice place for you to be able to get a little bit more familiar with the equipment itself. So while the, um, the Hercules 100, it also is, is designated for transnasal use. You can also use it just in the operating room. I use balloons in the operating room all the time. Um, as you can see here, I mean, this is a really nice little web that, that this was an iatrogenic web that, that uh, a patient had gotten after a, a, actually a larynx fracture about 20 years ago. Um, you can use the balloon, you know, you and the, you know, whether you have residents or you have other staff that's around you. Again, this is a really nice place to be able to kind of get used to the equipment. Um, just makes it a little bit easier. Rebecca, I know you like to do a lot of these in the office. What is your what are your numbers? Do you do most of these in the office? Do you half and half? What are you doing at Cincinnati right now? Yeah, it's a great question. I, you know, I'll be honest. I think I I probably do about one a week uh, in the office compared to maybe one a month in the operating room, and and I absolutely have a selection bias. Um, you know, my my empiric my empiric dilations and patients that uh that have you know what i call a benign larynx that have complete sensation oftentimes i'll take them to the or because you can't really see a web real easily um with the transnasal esophagoscopy you can see a radiated stricture easily but it's a lot harder to see kind of fine nuanced things like webs etc you think the average person just starting out doing t and e will have difficulty with this in the office or what are your thoughts about that yeah, I think, you know, this is something that you and I have talked a lot about is, you know, your familiarity with the equipment. And I think, you know, in, I think that you, I think you need to be able to do a good, a transnasal esophagoscopy. Um, now, I think, you know, one of the other things that I've, I've thought a lot about too recently is, you know, as, as otolaryngologists, we're all very, very um, facile and comfortable looking at mucosal disease, right? We do flexible laryngoscopy all the time, looking at mucosal disease. Um, so, doing an esophagoscopy really is not that much different. 
we are really, you're looking for a soft, you're looking for, you know, mucosal pathology, you're looking for head and neck cancers, you know, as, as, as you talked about before, oftentimes we're going to get a fluoro study or a barium study to be able to actually see strictures. You don't oftentimes see them on an esophagoscopy, but I think it's something that, you know, as otolaryngologists, sometimes I think people get a little bit leery of, uh, of, you know, missing something. And I'll say even, even uh, my first couple of years um, here in Cincinnati, I think I, I sent a lot more people to GI just to, just in case. So I think, I think it's important, but I also think that um, there's no reason not to get used to it. It's much, it's a lot of the same skills that we already have and that we are already used to doing. So I think, you know, getting used to the TNE, I think is a, is, is an important part of this. Um, so, do you, Dr. Howell, do you have any pearls on someone who is starting to do a uh, transition from OR to the office, mm -hmm. uh, other than the scope part, anything else they should be aware of or be careful about? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, so some of the things we're actually just getting into that you've like teed me up perfectly. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Perfect. No, it's great. So, so that's exactly what we're going to kind of go through right here is, is, you know, when and where, like, how do you get started? How do you, how do you transition from there? Um, as we said, the, the personnel is the equipment and familiarity in the room, proctoring and mentoring, proctoring and mentoring. Um, you know, Greg and I have talked a lot about this, about, you know, the time under COVID and the, you know, where everyone's, there's no traveling, you can't, ha you don't have extra people in the rooms, et cetera. It's, um, it, it is a little bit challenging right now, but I think that that's all, hopefully we're coming out of the COVID fog and that's all going to get better. Um, so some, some, so personnel, pathology and patient, and let's, let's sort of go through one by one. So, so personnel, as Greg said, this really takes three people. Um, my MA usually sets up part this part of it. So this is the scope, this, um, excuse me, this is the device. You can get, you can do this. It's the exact same thing in the OR as it is in the office. You can use sterile, uh, sterile, sterile saline or sterile water. Um, nice thing about that is, you know, if you bust a balloon, you're just giving them a little water. Um, and that's usually what I tell patients. You might, it might be a little salty, but um, as you can see, you sort of lure lock this thing on here. You get everything set up and ready to go as you're, and we'll do this. Some, I, now we're fast enough. My, my MA is pretty quick at getting this stuff together. So sometimes I'll tell her, well, it's a possible dilation. If we already know it is, she gets this all set up. It's ready. It's off in the corner um, and it's ready to go. The pathology. So one of the important things with this, and again, this is the equipment stuff. You, you, this is a Seldinger technique. So what you see is Greg here putting the wire over the balloon and then the balloon has to go through. So here's the extra person. So one person is holding on to the device and the balloon, um, the inflation device. And then you, also, you end up having two people then um, up at the head. One person has to be able to guide the balloon and to hold on to the balloon while the, um, uh, the other operator is, is driving the transnasal esophagoscopy. So it's gotta be an easily intubatable person. Um, it, so, you know, alaryngeal patients, these are great. These are the ones that, that, um, that you really wanna start with. These are patients that, you know, it's, it's you know, there's, there's only one hole in there. So I think if you're gonna start somewhere, this is the one to start with. So you wanna, you wanna pick the patient that is incredibly tolerant, you want to pick, the, you know, the staff that, you know, enjoys some of this. Greg and I have also talked, my speech language pathologists, they love helping out with these. Um, even my voice therapists are even tolerant. Maybe not Renee, who you saw, um, but they're even tolerant of holding the balloon for me if I need to, um, if I just need an extra set of hands. But the alaryngeal patients, for a lot of different reasons, as you can see here, there's just some nasty fungal infection as well. They've got lots of reasons to have dysphagia. So, um, so again, what you can actually, this is one of the things you can appreciate here. This is a, a typical balloon. This is a lot of wire that you have to pull through, um, which is so much nicer with the Hercules 100 as, as compared to this. Um, Greg, what about, um, any, any, do you get any resistance to your staff? My, my speech pathologists love it, but it, it's not for everybody. We went through a phase. We were doing a lot of these for a while. And then our our my main nurse got a little tired of them, I think, and so having been being able to run overlapping ORs, I did less and less of these for a while. But now we're back into it again. And I think, like Rebecca said, once you've demonstrated how to do it, you know, just take one really cooperative patient, take your time, go through things the day before, 
or the morning of with your staff. So everyone knows their roles and you get in there and go through it. Um, it's, it's not difficult. One of the things that Rebecca taught me, and I think one of the reasons some of my patients weren't tolerating as well is I used to uh, have them um, pump the balloon up really fast, kind of like I would in the operating room. And Rebecca shared with me when she started going really slow with enlarging the balloons and having the patient give them some feedback as they went along, that it was much taller. So we started doing that and it made a huge difference. And so going slow, an alaryngeal patient can raise their hand when they're feeling too much pressure. You can back off a millimeter or two of mercury in the balloon, then start again and slowly build up. And you can dilate folks a, a decent amount here with them being shockingly comfortable uh, during this. Now, speaking of comfortable, what do you do? We didn't mention anesthesia, Rebecca. How do you get these people prepared to put these wonderful balloons down there? Right, exactly. So I think, you know, with any, you know, transnasal esophagus scope um, and or any channeled scope, right, we're all, uh, you know, probably more facile with with channeled scopes. It's a it's a bigger bore um, tool. And so I always anesthetize the nose. The nose, I think, is the key. You got to get the decongestant. Um, you got to create some space in there. And then, um, so I usually just use a 50%, you know, Akron and lidocaine just on a cotton, on a, either a cotton fledget or, you know, I, I do exactly what you taught me, Greg. I just pull apart a piece of cotton, um, take a bayonet and you put it in there. And then I let them sit there. I think the biggest thing that I, the, the biggest mistake that I make is, um, to be honest, sitting and talking to the patient because then I hurry up. I actually put the, get the nose ready and I walk out of the room. So I get out of the room that way, at least I know that they're going to sit there for at least five to 10 minutes and just decongest rather than me kind of rushing them along. I use um, a lot of lidocaine lube, but beyond that, I actually don't do anything else. Again, my bias is the radiated patients and they don't have a lot of sensation already. So um, in a, in a tough patient in a gagger, you can definitely give them some lidocaine jelly just to help with the gag sensation but it doesn't change that pressure sensation that they feel. So follow up. So I think it just depends. It's probably, it's probably like all your other, you know, esophageal dilation patients. You can use an 810, you can use a FOIS, you can use email. I mean, now that we're, you know, medicine's finally coming out of the dark ages, we could actually use, you know, some, <laughs> we can use my chart if you are an Epic user, you can use some sort of uh, virtual technology here. Um, pain protocol, you know, Greg, do you give any of your patients any pain medicine? I don't. Nope, nope, none. So much like the um, Josina study, uh, I do think it's less painful. Um, is it less painful because of the balloon versus the bougie? I don't know. Is it because, you know, as Greg said too, I do a nice slow dilation rather than like an airway, you know, an airway balloon. We're used to kind of blowing up the balloon really fast and quick. And uh, I've gotten away from that from esophageal. Now, when they're asleep, I do do that. And to be quite honest, they usually have a lot more pain. Now, is that because of the rigid, the rigid scopes and because you're putting them under tension? Um, or is it because we're dilated and being a little bit rougher? I'm not sure. The other thing is I also use, so I pretty, pretty typically will use a 15 to 18 millimeter balloon in the office. Some patients, you really can't get past 15. I would say the large majority I get to about 18, but I'll go up to an 18 to 20 or the super stretch in the OR. Um, but that's a big balloon for the office. Severe strictures, um, you know, can really be dilated even every every couple of weeks. Greg, any thoughts on like the rendezvous procedure or tough, tough, complete I, I stricture? I think this plays a great role in this. I mean, we used to do rendezvous and leave a feeding tube or an NG tube in and then come back, you know, a week and a half, two weeks later, then another couple of weeks, then a number of couple of weeks. Uh, with the in-office dilations, once you've established a lumen in the operating room with a rendezvous procedure, you can take care of these patients in the office maintain that lumen. And it's, it's a real winner. I think particularly in people that were having trouble keeping their esophagus or neopharynx open, this is a great way to do it without repetitive trips to the operating room. We have a question for both of you. How many total laryngectomy patients have you dilated so far? Bunches, bunches. Okay. Yeah. A lot. That's, that's yeah. It, it, yeah, a lot. So the other question I have is, uh, there are other balloon dilators as well. What are the specific things about the cook dilator which you like uh, makes it different? 
Great I, question. I, well, there's, there's, there's several good things. I think it was kind of funny looking at that video because I didn't appreciate it before, uh, but it's the length of the guide wire. I mean, we'd be all lying to you if we didn't tell you we hadn't been smacked in the face or smacked other people with this guide wire. It's like a snake in there. It's hitting people right and left. And so, it, and plus it's time. You've got to run this balloon over this. And, you know, time literally is money. And none of us want to be there just running, you know, balloons over a 210, 220 um, um, centimeter long guide wire. And so it's way shorter. It's real fast. I like it in the OR. Once again, it's fast. It's short guide wire. There's not guide all over the place. And it's actually FDA approved. And, you know, most institutions would prefer, you know, that we would get use approved equipment. And this is approved for transnasal usage in the office when no other um, devices currently are. The other thing that I like about it too is I we've been using in the office we've been using like a hand a hand gun so you kind of turn you turn the knob you know you go up you go down and you just squeeze the knob um, but this is just a just a simple hand piece the inflation device is easier I mean that was you know the first time that we switched um, to the Hercules uh, the my EMA that was the first thing she said was like the wire was so much better the inflation device was so much better. I said, so you liked it? She's like, yeah, can we please get this? So I think, uh, I think especially for the office staff who it is, it's like a juggling act trying to keep this wire from like bouncing off the floor. Cause that's the other thing, you know, patients see it bounce off the floor and well, you know, it's a dirty thing anyways, but you really, you're kind of stuck with going and opening a new one. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's, you lose style points. If you put the instruments on the floor, then try to use them again. Right. So other advantage, we've mentioned a couple of these, these already, uh, but no downtime. Um, you know, our, our medical assistants, our nurses are setting all this kind of thing up while we're seeing other patients. You can have a separate procedure room. I use our largest room is used for these type of procedures. And so there is really no downtime. You go in, the patients are already numbed up. You do the procedure. You talk to them very briefly. Hey, just sit here for a few minutes. You go see another follow-up. Then you come back. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm doing great now, doc. Um, and just, you know, then discuss your follow-up, discuss reasons, you know, starts bringing up blood to come back, those things. And it really fits very easily into your normal clinic flow. And we'll talk about costs, I think, uh, at some point here today as well. It's a whole lot less expensive to do almost anything in the office compared to the operating room. Here's a laryngeal patient right here. And, you know, not the first kind of patient you want to start with because of the fact that um, if the balloon's too high on a hypopharyngeal stricture or proximal esophageal stricture, you will force the balloon into the airway a little bit. Um, they will, if you get them super, super numb, they're going to aspirate a little bit of their own secretions. And if they've got pooling already, then I would really encourage you to use the teeny scope to suck anything out of there beforehand. And Rebecca noted when you're ballooning, and you're watching what's going on. You're looking for bleeding. You're looking for the balloons, watermelon seeding or pushing back. And if, if saliva is accumulating, you can go ahead and get those secretions out of there. So like here, you're following the thing along. This is a patient underwent an esophagectomy, I think, for cancer that we found on a t &E earlier. And I think this is an anastomotic stricture after the esophagectomy. Yeah, there's staples still there. Um, following the esophagectomy and had developed a little stricture. And so we went ahead and ballooned this um, in the office. And, you know, you get immediate feedback on these things. You're watching it. There's the, the stomach up in the chest. And then we can balloon this thing open. And once again, it's a question of talking to the patient, not unlike an injection augmentation or in-office laser surgery, it's a relationship with the patient. It's talking back and forth. If they're feeling a little discomfort, you slow down, find out what's going on. Is it the nose? Is it the throat? Um, if I have people raise their hands, if they're having discomfort during the dilation, so the hand starts to come up, you know, you can immediately just have your assistant, you know, deflate a little bit and they deflate. You can suction the secretions or blood, look what's going on. And um, it's, a, it's a lot of teamwork, but we have to remember the patient's part of that team as well. And talking with the patient during this, particularly obviously when they have a larynx in place, makes all the difference in the world. We let significant others stay in the room 
so they can watch. Um, if they want to hold their hands, they can do that. It gets a little crowded around the patient then, but we've let people do that. And so they can sit there and support their, their, their family member, spouse, friend, or whatever. And so this is the same here. You see right here, staying right on top of the balloon, looking around, taking your secretions, and then wide open. So the esophageal remnant in the stomach are wide open now. And then pull everything out, shoot water if there's a little bleeding there with the T and E scope and surprisingly well tolerated in patients. It really, really is. As long as you remember to, as, as Rebecca taught me, is to expand the balloon slowly and watch and get feedback from the patient as you're doing so. So Greg, what about complications? What kind of complications have you had with these? Nothing significant. You know, our, our complications that we've had have been when we've been really aggressive in the operating room. And so doing super dilations in radiation chemotherapy patients. I've had a handful of people we've had to keep overnight when we hadn't planned because of deep lacerations. And so you get a big laceration, um, you examine it carefully, you make sure you're not out in the neck somewhere or mediastinum. And the biggest thing is we've had bleeding enough, we've had to cauterize people. And that really defeats the purpose. You know, you're trying to not create more scar tissue. And, but we had two people who got really deep lacerations that were just bleeding so much that we had to use cautery. And that's just going to give you a more intense scar and a worse stricture. And that's happened a couple of times. But we've had people, we'll keep them in MPO, um, give them antibiotics, keep them overnight, make sure they're happy. And then let, them, we've let everyone go the next day. We've never had a perforation. We probably will eventually, um, but not yet. And, the, and in the office, no issues at all. Even, you know, we've done, you know, teenies in general, hundreds and hundreds, and the occasional vasovagal event, a little spitting up blood, nothing much more than that. And that's the same. I, we, you and I have talked about this. I think even with just trans, they're basically the same same complications you get with a transnasal esophagoscopy by itself. Um, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you get some epistaxis in a, in a, in a tight nose, um, uh, especially with somebody that is on anticoagulation. I've gotten a couple of nosebleeds. Never, knock on wood, never had to pack one, but um, certainly had some, some self-resolving, you know, spontaneously resolving um, nosebleeds. You know, I've had one patient, I think, that ended up having kind of a delayed bleed, but same. It just ended up, he ended up going to an outside hospital actually the next day and, uh, you know, was totally fine. They watched him. He was okay. Nothing else happened. You know, ironically, I, in the first, in, in the paper that I had written um, on the, esoph the esophageal dilations, one of the reviewers, we had, we had initially said that bleeding was a complication, uh, a bleeding at the, at the radiated, at the dilation site. And one of the reviewers actually said, well, in fact, you know, if you don't have any bleeding, then you probably didn't go far enough. So now, well, yeah, as Greg said, if it's not a pumper, if it's not something, you know, for the most part, they really, patients really do well. They don't usually, you know, I, bleeding has not really been an issue. So um, mm -hmm. was there any time you had to, um, a planned office procedure, you had to change it to the OR? No, I mean, I've had patients that don't tolerate it. So I've had intolerant patients. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, you know, also, I, as I said, I'm, I'm, my, my patient population is a bit biased because I also get most of my referrals are from, from my head and neck colleagues for in-office dilation and then also from my speech pathologist. So my speech pathologists have already sort of talked to them about it. They've already sort of in it, they, they know exactly what I'm doing. They're there a lot of times. Um, and, and a lot of them will even schedule, you know, when we do multidisciplinary clinics. And so they'll schedule their patients on a day that, you know, we're working together and the patients just love it. Um, it works out real well. Uh, one of the questions we have is what are your indications for super dilation? Well, that's a shout out to Bob Eller. Hi, Bob. How are you? He's a, uh, he's an old friend over in South Carolina um, two different patient groups, the non-radiated groups. I, I always want to do a bare minimum of 60 French on these people. So if they get 60 French, and as Rebecca said, if there's no bleeding, then we need to do more. And so the vast majority of non-radiated people are going to get something beyond a 60 French. As, fellow, as far as billing's concerned, you don't get paid any extra to hit 90. Um, but so we like to hit 90 for obvious reasons then. Um, but 
non-radiated, that's our indication. Um, and then in the radiated group, um, my rule has, al has always been not to do a super dilation on a radiated patient on your first dilation, even if there isn't a minimal bleed bleeding. And when I have violated my own rule, which I have violated on two occasions, I have a hundred percent complication rate. Those were two of the people that bled a lot were people that, oh, this, they're not bleeding very much. Let's put a 20 French bougie with the 20, with the 60 balloon. And I, and I regret it on both occasions. So um, if you can get someone to 60 and not radiated, keep going. If it's radiated, I stop then. Then later, I'll try to go beyond 60 French if they're radiated. Rebecca, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree. I have done less, admittedly, super dilations. I just haven't gotten as thick a skin as you and Peter. Um, but I agree. I think, it, I mean, it's a, it is, it's a bigger, as I said, I mean, I definitely adjust for in the office. I do the 15 to 18 in the OR. I'll go up to 18 to 20 and I've done a couple super stretches. Um, I have done them on radiated patients, but I agree. It's got to be real. You got to be real gentle. You got to be really careful and, and know the patient, you know, well enough because they can. I mean, that you know, you give them a perf and you're, you're, you're way back. I mean, you're, you're not even at ground zero. You've, you've just gone, you know, you put them in a hole. Um, I've had to have, have had several patients that are really, well, actually come in for esophageal, esophagoscopy or esophageal dilation because they have had a perf before. And so they get real nervous about going to the OR and they get very anxious about it, but are, you know, just feel more comfortable being awake. Uh, is is um, super dilation approved by uh, the balloon company itself or is it considered off-label use? <laughs> that is, it is, it is considered off-label. Um, I, uh, it's going to take some time before that ever gets okay, but it's, it's become such a valuable uh, part of my practice. And, you know, a lot of residents and fellows that have left here, um, we're big believers in it. And um, if, you, if you just do a 60 French, you're, you're leaving a lot of pathology on the table you're not dealing with. And there, there's lots of talks folks have given with pictures of a big dilator in place, and you still see a web adjacent to it that's not even being touched yet. Um, and I said, the vets are the ones, dogs are the ones they started this with. And they realized they could do these super physiologic stretches on dogs. And mm -hmm. then had Joe Spiegel and then Peter Belofsky started to, to look into this. And it's a huge, huge improvement um, in what we can offer our patients. Uh, there's a, patient, a question more about t &E itself. Um, what kind of scopes do you use for your TNE, and do you use any special ones? And do you use any anything which has insufflation? Um, if you've got K Pentax scope, then use their TNE scope. You had Olympus, use theirs. Whatever you're happy with. There's no there's no magical scope. Uh, if you have a neopharyngeal stricture, you can use a channeled laryngoscope mm -hmm. for that because it's long enough to get down there, which we've done, and, and it just it makes life easier because it's shorter. Um, insufflation, yes. I mean, it's part of T and E is you insufflate to look for pathology. Once you've done that, I've not found a need to do insufflation during a dilation. Um, I guess if you, you know, I've, I've not had to during dilation, but for diagnostic, it's pretty much required. I agree with everything Greg said. Oh, I have both. Here. You're going to give so, us, we're, yeah. I know we're doing, we're, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> um, so money, everyone, it, it always comes down to money, right? Um, so I think it really just depends, right? It depends on where where you are located. So do you have a procedure suite? Do you have access to an outpatient center? You know, are you office based? Um, you know, if you're, if are you, is your office hospital based? Is it a site of service uh, eleven versus the hospital, which is a twenty two? Those things all come into, those are all factors in this. Um, there is no, we don't have a CPT code for transnasal dilation, but this is all, it falls all under the same, it's flexible, you know, flexible endoscopic dilation, which is, which you can use with a, with a balloon, with or without a guide wire as well. Um, the other thing that we do is we also build the um, balloon itself. So we, we build the device. So I think that's another option that you have, but 
you know, I think at the end of the day, you just really got to talk, you got to talk to your business manager and find out, you know, what's going to work for your site. Greg? That's good. I'm with you. Oh, dilate everything. Yeah, I was actually doing typing to for a question. You know, you've already learned now how to do neopharyngeal and esophageal lysis with a larynx. So what are you going to do next? Well, you can dilate anything with this. We've, you know, do our globus patients. We all hate globus patients uh, to one extent or another. Um, should we be dilating these people in the office? I don't know the answer to this. Certainly neopharynx is great. The CP, have that. Nasopharynx too. We published a few years ago, people that have had nasopharyngeal stenosis after radiation therapy or after a UP3, and this is one of these patients, you just squirt lidocaine all through there and slowly, this is, you know, we've advanced a little bit, slowly inflate the balloon. And we've had tremendous success in people with nasopharyngeal stenosis. We're not laying flaps in there. We're not putting stents in there through their nose and down their nasopharynx. We're just ballooning them. And my thought now with flexible needles, you probably inject some steroids in there as well. But we've been stunned at the success rate in these people by just ballooning. This is, a, this is obviously one of my edits, not very well done. And, but you'll see here in a moment, you couldn't get a flexible laryngoscope through the stenosis. And then once we balloon it, um, it is absolutely wide open. You can see the there, and you see down the, down the pharynx on both sides where it was torn. And so we should keep moving on for the sake of time, but oh, just stretch anything you wanna stretch. Just, just go slow with it when you do it and talk to the patient when you're going about it. This is a shout out for a couple things here at the end before we take some last questions is you folks there that are really interested in dysphagia, especially when we get back in person, the, the dysphagia surgery side of the, um, at the ABA is an organization of people that want to do better for our patients. We want to learn and take what we're learning and bring this to our patients because these people are miserable. Most of us would agree in most cultures in, in the world, eating is more important even than talking and we got to do a better job and just join us. And the final shout out is Dr. Howell is running Laryngeal Fellows Day and I'm one of the co-directors along with Donna Lundy, um, uh, Dr. Rossow from the University of Miami and Dr. Ashley O'Rourke at the Medical University of South Carolina. We are really hoping to be in person in Miami and we really hope you folks will enjoy it. Uh, join us, spread the word. It's gonna be a hybrid meeting. And so we really love to see you folks down there. So we got Dr. Mehta. So uh, if there's other questions, we can uh, field those for a few yeah, minutes. Yeah, there's one question. How big is the wire and does it go through all channels scopes? Hmm. Good question. Um, you know, we've got a balloon That's right big. here. Yeah, the second the, the second one's easy. It goes through all of our two millimeter channeled um, scopes. Right. The actual length, what you got there? Does it have Rebecca? Well, the, I think the length is 100, but what's the, the diameter? I think it's got to be, I mean, it's got to be less than a 1.8 because it fits through the uh, two millimeter yeah, channel. It, it fits, or fits easy. I'm going to guess that one of our cook people is going to type out that answer any moment now on the chat screen. That would be my, that would be my, my hope. Yeah, I was just going to suggest that. I know we've got a couple of colleagues there, so feel free to uh, change your two to all panelists and attendees to answer that yeah. question. If you could. So one more question we have is, what do you do when you have bleeding? Do you just tamponade or use a balloon to tamponade it or do something else? You want that one first, Rebecca? I just tell them to start drinking water. <laughs> <laughs> tell them ice water. So. Yeah. I, you know, we do, we go, I go get them, uh, get them a nice glass of ice water and, uh, and tell them to go get a smoothie on their way home. And, um, and actually that, that's actually okay. pretty, when I've had some bleeding in the airway, when I've done some balloons in the airway and I've had some bleeding, I've shot Afrin down mm -hmm. the, you know, I put the, like the, our little lidocaine wash pipe, the little sprayer. Mm -hmm with Afrin and I'll just ch 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 spray Afrin all over some airways that are bleeding more than I like. I would do that mm -hmm. if I had mm -hmm. to. Ice water. Um, in the OR, tamponade is usually the simplest thing to do. You, you go ahead, you take in a damp gauze, you know, balloon first, that's not enough. Damp gauze, just pack it. 
for a few minutes, then maybe an epinephrine pledge it. And I said, in a few instances, if I had been forced to use cautery, just because I, I made some poor judgment on a couple of patients. There it is, 100 centimeters long. Rebecca gets the prize, hence the name Hercules 100. What a shock. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Troy had said, wire guy is 0 0.038, diameter 200 centimeters long. So thank you to our friends at Cook for sharing that. Scott, yeah. Scott Howard asked about uh, insufflation after dilations. Um, not in the office. There's no problem with that. When I've had big lacerations in the operating room, they've all been so proximal that I've not needed to insufflate for any reason. I'm, I'm right there. And it's right there in front of me. I will put a DITO, you saw in the video, I'll put a DITO laryngoscope post cricoid, suspend it and do all the work through that. Um, and so it's very simple to, to use two hands and deal with a the laceration. There's no reason to have to insufflate when it's really proximal. If it was distal and bad, I probably would probably avoid it. But that's that yet has not happened yet. Fantastic. Uh, Hercules, I'm sorry, I mean, Dr. Postma, uh, thank you so much. And Dr. Howell, a pleasure as always uh, for this very informative session. And, and thank you to our friends at the Cook Medical for making this possible. Um, you can see Dr. Howell and Dr. Postma's contact information there if you have any questions about today's presentation. Um, I shared the link of the Hercules 100 in the chat and feel free to visit that landing page um, and to fill out the form if any of you are interested in hearing from your Cook rep. Um, again, this form is intended for US-based patients only. Um, however, if you are interested in seeing uh, this presentation, we will be sharing it with our colleagues at Cook. It'll be in a distribution, I'm sure as well as everyone who's registered will get access to this recording uh, in about 24 hours. So um, with that, Dr. Postman, Dr. Howell, anything to add before we give everyone their evening back? I, I would just say, Rebecca and I love talking about this stuff. You've got our emails. Feel free to contact either of us with questions or concerns. We, we're more than willing to talk, chat with you about things. Absolutely. Fantastic all. Thank you so much, Dr. Postman, Dr. Howell. Uh, Dr. Meta, pleasure as always, and to you Thank all. you. Have a great evening, a safe night. Thank and, you uh, all. Well, Thank you. Morning, wherever you are. Uh, and we'll see you all very soon. Great. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Dr. Meta. Thanks. Bye.